Franklin Covey's podcast on Leadership with Scott Miller, airing twice weekly conversations on Tuesdays and Fridays, both audio and video, where each week I have the continued privilege to sit in this chair in this studio and have amazing conversations from people from broad experiences about their own leadership journeys. As you know, I'm also privileged to host a second podcast for Franklin Covey on a separate set about 12 feet that way called C-Suite Conversations with Scott Miller, where each week on Thursdays we interview episodes from people in the C-Suite. And today's guest would ideally be on that other podcast because he is formerly from the C-Suite in the energy sector from Australia. But our guest today is Martin Moore, and he's more than just a high-performing C-Suite leader. He actually is a podcast host based here in the U.S., although hails from Australia, a leadership coach, and a best-selling author of this book, No BS Leadership. Now, for those of you who are clients of Franklin Covey, you know we tend to be a little bit of a conservative company, not a lot of F-bombs or BS drum bombs dropped around here, um, except for from me. However, today, for the sensitivity of our leadership, I'm going to refer to our guest book as No BS Leadership. I have Martin joining us today because... The breadth of his experience as a leadership coach and consultant, a podcast host, author, and um, keynote speaker, as I mentioned, is remarkable. And so, as with that, I want to introduce Martin Moore to On Leadership. It's just great to be here, Scott. Thanks for having me. Martin, great to meet you. Obviously, from your accent, you are from Australia. You live here in the U.S., currently based out of Boston. I had the privilege of being a guest on your podcast recently from a recent book that I wrote, The Ultimate Guide to Great Mentorship, and you and I hit it off so well, and I found your interview style and questions, and quite frankly, depth around leadership so appealing. I invited you to come back on this podcast because I think you have enormous amount to add to the evolving conversation around leadership. Martin, we're going to spend most of our time today talking about your release, No BS Leadership. Before we do that, I'd love it if you'd take a few minutes and rewind a couple of decades and reorient your professional journey to our listeners and viewers so that they can have context for how you came to be this renowned leadership coach, keynoter, and podcast host. Sure, Scott. Well, my upbringing was relatively unremarkable. Uh, my parents, family of five children, really believed in the power and the value of education. So they sacrificed a lot of what they could have had themselves to make sure that the five of us were educated in the best possible way. And uh, I didn't start off my career in a stellar fashion. I was studying law at the University of Sydney. Uh, in fact, sorry, that's a gross overstatement. I was enrolled in a law degree at the University of Sydney and squandered that opportunity terribly. And so I dropped out of there mucked around for a couple of years trying to find myself and then got into computer programming. I was actually a software developer. Now this is in the days long before software development was a cool thing to do. And, uh, and I came through there, became a project manager and then decided I wanted to have a bigger career. So I tried to transition across to business. And my journey from there from about 25 years ago was interesting because I went across so many different industries and so many different job families. And so I did the whole tour of you know, um, mining, transportation, insurance, energy. And I worked as a chief information officer, a CFO, a head of strategy and head of sales and marketing. So because of these experiences where I was not at all familiar with the technical aspects of the role, I had to learn how to lead and how to get the best out of people. And so in 2018, I set up this business with my daughter, Emma Green, and we're taking on the world of leadership, our purpose, to improve the quality of leaders globally, not at all ambitious. Beyond the provocative title of your book, and what a great cover, just very simple and very clear about what this is about, uh, I found one concept that I really, really enjoyed. This is idea, this idea of uh, the difference between leadership capability and business acumen, because they are complementary ne necessities, competencies, for any leader, but would you just remind us of this simple but profound need to differentiate an excess of one does not make up for a deficiency in another. They're actually different but complementary skills. Talk about you know, leadership capability and business acumen and why they are essential to have both of them as a modern day leader. Well, I think it is absolutely essential to have both, Scott. Interestingly, I found that I met hundreds and hundreds of capable, intelligent, experienced, competent business executives during my time in corporate. 
I found very few that I would actually call great leaders. And this sort of struck me as being quite a, a weird uh, paradox because you had these people who were heading up large organisations, uh, posting incredible results for, the, for those organisations, but still were not able to lead their people. I, I, I know one CEO who was incredibly conflict averse. He could not have a direct, meaningful, compassionate, connected conversation with the people who worked for him. He was an avoider. Yet he was running this unbelievable business, running it incredibly well, and earning a huge amount of money. So this whole dichotomy of the business executive and the great leader struck me like a pie in the face. It was, it was just amazing to watch. And I had to break down the anatomy of what leadership was as opposed to a business executive because with my background, it was clear that the two of them were complementary but very, very different sets of skills. Martin, let's take that a bit deeper because I think that's not necessarily an aha for anyone, but I, love how, <laughs> but, I, but I love how you frame this in the book. Let's take for someone, for example, that has a, a software background like yourself, right? They're highly technically competent on information technology, IS systems, all of the you know, security protocols and, and all those things that require you to have the technical competence to deliver extraordinary value to your business. And now you are promoted to move away from just being an individual contributor where your technical knowledge and expertise, where you can be an introvert, where you can be conflict avoidant, where you can be lots of things that don't require you to become a great leader of people. But now you have moved out of becoming an individual contributor to the leader of the software developers. Remind us, at the, at the, at the expense of maybe even being rudimentary, remind us of those soft skills, those power skills those leadership capabilities that people need to have today to become a great leader of your former peers that are the software developers? What's usually lacking? What's usually lacking, I think, Scott, is just that, uh, that sense of identity. The fact that I'm no longer going to get by on my own individual brilliance. I now need to be able to get the most out of others. And at that very first promotion level, you can still have your hands on all of those levers, right? It's very easy to dip down into your people's work. And when something's not being done the right way, you just go and compensate for them. So you jump in and you fix things. And then you say to yourself, I'm leading from the front. I wouldn't ask my people to do anything that I wouldn't be prepared to do myself. And so we rationalise these things terribly. But of course, as you go up through the layers of management, you get to the point where that no longer works for you. You can't possibly be in all of that level of detail. So the things that leaders need to focus on, and first and foremost, is the concept that you're there to get results. Now, this is obviously where business acumen and leadership actually combine. And you can get a lot of good results through your business acumen. But as a leader, you've got to liberate the talent of the people you have working for you. On a small team of six people, you're not going to run into too much trouble. If you're leading a 10,000 person organisation, it's a completely different proposition. So you've got to be really comfortable with the leadership paradox of, the higher up I go, the less control I have, but the more accountability I have to shoulder. And so accountability is a huge theme, and taking accountability for things you don't necessarily have direct control over. So that's one of those differentiators. But there are also things around you know, your ability to handle conflict, because as a leader, you're stepping into conflict all the time, every day. There's no way to avoid it. And so you've just got to be OK with that. You can't, you can't agonize over it. You can't change it. You've just got to be OK with that. Uh, and I found that when I was a CEO in Australia, any given day that I walked into the organisation, at least 5% of the people hated me for no apparent reason. No apparent reason at all. Now, there were lots more that hated me with good reason, but I was never going to change that. So I've got to be really comfortable with this concept of sitting in conflict when I'm not going to be liked. And the higher up I go, the less I'm going to be liked, the less people agree with my decisions. So part of that leadership is letting go, and it's counterintuitive. Our, get, our listeners and viewers are now very apparent why I invited you on this call because of your plain spokenness, but your insight. Your, your comment about rushing in and kind of saving the day reminds me, Franklin Covey's uh, has a leadership offering aimed primarily at first line, first time mid-level leaders. It's called The Six Critical Practices for Leading a Team. I was privileged to be one of the co-authors on a book by the same name. Practice one is develop a leader's mindset. And in this practice, we teach that a leader's role is to achieve results with and through other people. 
Yes, you can rush in and save the day. Yes, you can solve it, but then you will become a victim. You'll become a martyr. You'll always be working in the system, not, quote, on the system. I love the way you talk about that. It requires a level of maturity and coaching and empowerment and patience to build the capability in your people so you constantly aren't rushing in and saving the day. As a result, emasculating them, minimizing them, micromanaging them, but never building in them the capability to do the work so that you don't have to then become a martyr and a victim. To quote you, it's a bit of a vicious cycle, is it not? Kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the problem is that you've still got to get the outcomes. And so it's just such a judgment call. This is, this is not black and white, Scott, as you know. Such a judgment call. When do I step in? When do I stand back? And I think like anything else, it's governed by the concept of risk. You look at something and you say, okay, what's the risk if this person fails at what they're doing? And if it's not great, well, let them go. They've got to fall over. And you've got to pick them up and they've got to learn from that because otherwise they'll never learn and your capability will remain weak in your team. So you can't step in all the time, but when it's critical stuff, you've got to use that judgment and say, okay, on this occasion, I'm in there, right? We, we can't drop this ball. Yeah, yeah. But by the same token, I'm going to circle back around and in the coaching process, I'm going to say, okay, let's just work out what happened last time and why did it happen? And how are we going to avoid that for next time? Because this is your job, not mine. I'm not going to do it again for you. I've done it once. Let's see how we can get you to do it next time. Martin, I think it's a, it's a challenge all leaders face. I face it myself, right? As the chief marketing officer of this firm for nearly a decade, I was constantly in this tension of when do I empower my team and when do I step back and when do I step in and make sure there's no ball dropped. It reminds me of uh, several years ago, we were relaunching our business in greater China. And we had big launch events from moving from a licensee partnership model to going direct in China. We were relaunching our offices in Beijing and Shanghai. And we had the entire executive team there, uh, of which I was a member, but I was also producing the event with a very competent group of people. And I think uh, as we were doing walkthroughs of this launch, some of my team members were mocking me. Uh, did you ever see the, the movie um, The Wedding Planner with Steve Martin? I think oh, it was Mar yes, Martin Short was like the Frank, the wedding planner. And they were mocking <laughs> me like being Frank, the wedding planner, because I was micromanaging every step, mainly because Franklin Covey, CEO and chairman, had flown to Beijing and Shanghai in front of thousands of potential clients and employees. And it's one of those Murphy's Law thing where his technology never works, right? I mean, there's always a problem in this, and that was not going to happen on my launch. And so the event went flawless. I'm sure I pissed off some people. But the fact is the CEO boarded the plane, come home, and the event was flawless. You have to determine when you're going to step in and when you're not. It's a tension I know. I'm going to skip around a little bit because there's some great concepts sure. in your book that I think you are especially articulate on. The next one is this idea of grace under pressure. One of the key leadership insights I learned from our chairman and former CEO, Bob Whitman, is the necessity of self-regulation. We all have tempers. We all have sh shorter or longer fuses. But you write a lot about how important it is to be grace graceful under pressure. Expand on that. Well, Scott, I think the concept here for me comes from the fact that I could see a lot of leaders who could put their game face on, as I like to call it. So under pressure and in uh, desperate circumstances and crises, they could get through by putting on a stony face, remaining disconnected and just trying to push through. But there are a lot of disadvantages to that. Uh, number one, your people can sense that it's not congruent. So they can see that what you're trying to display on the outside is not how you feel on the inside. And so you can make a lot of mistakes that way. And in the book, I talk about you know, the, the number of different types of leadership behaviors that you see in real crisis situations. So I even categorize them. We've got Teflon leaders who seem to blame everyone else and nothing sticks to them. We've got landmine leaders who just explode when something goes wrong. They're fantastic while the sailing's calm. And then when something goes wrong, they explode. And then we've got catatonic leaders who hide in the desk, under the desk, you know, in fetal position. You'll find those in the corner. And they just avoid making decisions. But a leader with grace under pressure has complete congruence between what they're displaying on the outside and what they're feeling on the inside. They are genuinely calm. They are genuine, genuinely relaxed. It doesn't mean that they don't care about what's going on, but it means they have a coping mechanism that is completely congruent and consistent throughout their being. And this gives everyone around them a sense of calm. And I used to say to my executive team at CS Energy quite often, you know, guys, don't panic. 
It's not time to panic yet. I'll let you know when it's time to panic. At the moment, we're doing fine. I have complete confidence in your ability to dig us out of this problem. So let's just get into it. And that was something that was really empowering for them. And they're thinking, well, if the CEO's not worried, then I shouldn't be either. It's the CEOs that rant and yell and scream and look really, really pressured when something goes wrong that the osmosis pushes that down through the layers of leadership in the organization. It's the difference between being a leader who creates a tense culture and an intense culture. I think that comes with Indeed. knowledge and maturity. Uh, you also talk about an, an idea that I'd never heard of before. Now, I've read a few leadership books, as evidenced by the set behind and around <laughs> me, and I've dedicated 30 years, but I'd never heard of the concept of what you call AQ, like IQ and EQ, you call it AQ. You did not invent this term. In fact, you credit the person that I think popularized yeah. it. But it's called your adversity quotient. And this really got me. In fact, I stopped the book and I put it down. I was reading this particular chapter at a little French restaurant over breakfast one morning. And I put the book down. And I thought about what is my own AQ in my family as a father and a spouse, as an entrepreneur, as a de facto leader here still at Franklin Covey with some people that I have relationships with. Talk about what AQ is, and maybe more importantly, how you develop it. Well, Scott, AQ is the uh, ability to handle conflict, just like your intelligence quotient is how much intellectual horsepower you have, and EQ is your ability to socialize and get uh, results through other people. I think AQ is all about how much can you withstand, how much pressure can you withstand. And I talk about in the book that these are like three legs of a stool in the successful career of any executive. Yeah. And so what we're looking at, you've got to have a combination of IQ, EQ, and AQ. If one of those legs of the stool is either underdeveloped, i.e. too short, or missing, then the stool is simply not going to work. So this is a critical component. And I like it more from a conceptual perspective than anything else. Can you measure it? Yeah, I don't know, maybe. Uh, and they say you can, but I, I just like the concept of having those three things of resilience, emotional intelligence, and IQ as being the foundations of a su successful career. You only develop AQ the same way you develop muscles. You lift weight, you use them, you put them under pressure, you stress them, and you learn over time that you can take more and more stress, more and more pressure, and that you have coping mechanisms. Not just that I can absorb a lot, aren't I great, aren't I courageous, and by the way, I'm burned out as all hell, but that's okay because I can handle it. And it's more about the ability to grow over time with that level of calm precision that we talk about in Grace Under Pressure. So when the, the biggest things went wrong in my career as I was getting later on, I didn't have any worries about them. I knew it wasn't fatal. And for some people who are in industries where things are fatal, but, but in mine it wasn't. And, and you know, it's the ability to just dig deep, use the tools you have, and not let the pressure get to you. Martin, in the book, you write that resilience is a common trait in successful leaders. And to some extent, you know, having strong AQ and resiliency are the same thing. I think for people that are like you and I, right, um, we've had multi-decades careers, we've seen so many problems, we're able to differentiate between the urgent and the importance, you hope, and we know that when something is potentially fatal and when it's just a problem. Would you speak today to those people that perhaps are new to leadership? Perhaps they're a first-time or frontline leader. They're, they've just moved into the leadership position. And they haven't been perhaps tested dozens and dozens of times like you and I. We have a little more rational approach. Any advice you would give a new or starting leader to understand how to build their AQ skills? Questions they can ask themselves, how to keep some perspective around it. Because it really becomes your brand, right? Your AQ is a crucial part of your reputation, your brand, and whether or not people want to work for you as a leader. You're absolutely right, Scott. And I think that one of the things about AQ and developing AQ is that there are tools you can use at any level of leadership or even as a pre-leader. You can use these tools to actually develop your sense of being able to cope. These are coping mechanisms. They should teach them in high schools. And if you think about, you know, of course, Stephen Covey's unbelievable work, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, the difference between the circle of influence and the circle of concern. And if you just think about that model alone, we spend so much time worrying about stuff that we cannot make a difference to. And we get locked down on this and we agonize and we get anxious and we get fearful. And this triggers the fear response, which in humans obviously is the, the primary driver, is the fear response. And so when it triggers that, 
we lose our objectivity, we lose our calmness, we lose our ability to think clearly. And so part of it is, okay, let's use this tool. Let's, let's use this. Let's, if you want to print it out on a sheet of April paper and write on it, do that. But some way, somehow, start thinking about letting go of the stuff you can't control. And that's, that's a pretty good start. The other thing is that I find, you know, obviously with the, the, the fight or flight mechanism, we always jump to the worst case scenario straight away. And understanding what that is and knowing that it's not going to be devastating in the long term. So I have a, a heap of questions you can either ask yourself or if you're a senior leader in an organisation, ask your team, ask the people around you. How big a deal is this going to be in a week? Now I just find that one question, how, how big a deal is this going to be in a week? Today the sky is falling, but in a week's time, have a look at the forecast. It's going to be blue skies and sunny with a nice little zephyr coming from the east. I mean, it's going to be beautiful. So why do we let ourselves get bogged down and destroyed in the moment because of our fear response when it's not actually legitimate. It's actually all fabricated in our heads. As you're speaking, it reminds me of a Franklin Covey concept we teach in our leadership offering about sometimes you have to protect your team from urgencies. Mm. And no one oh, yeah. can survive in, a, in an urgency-addicted culture. And sometimes that means you have to protect your team from yourself. Meaning, as a leader, it's very obvious to those that know me, I love... Uh, a good crisis. I do, I think, my best work when the dopamine, the adrenaline is, is pouring in. Quite frankly, I love to save the day. And I don't, I'm not proud of that, but I'm self-aware enough to know I love to save the day. And if a crisis doesn't exist, I'll cook one up. I'll elevate stuff that isn't crisis worthy <laughs> to crisis worthy so that I can save the day and get my validation. And I think part of being a self-aware leader, you know, grace under pressure, is being mature enough to say to your team, hey, let's just talk straight. You all know I love a good crisis. You know I love to save the day. You know it's how I get my validation. I'm not proud of it. Do me a favor. The next time you see me elevating a non-crisis to crisis level, would you call me aside? Like physically call me aside and talk to me about it in the hopes that I'll, I'll um, summon the maturity to say you're right, let's reassess that. I'm guessing in your coaching and keynoting, you deal with a lot of leaders that have similar propensities. We all want to be validated, whether you're just being validated by the board of directors or your investors or your partners. What would you say are the most common leadership challenges that leaders aren't self-aware of, but if they had some conversations like that, they could transform their culture? What are the things you see consistently that sometimes leaders need to protect their teams from themselves. That's just a, a sensational point, Scott. I think what we're tapping into here is a leader's need to demonstrate fallibility. So maybe in your case, it's the, uh, you know, I, I own up to the fact that I love a crisis, I love the validation that comes from that, and I love the adrenaline hit that it, that it brings with it. You have to be really confident to be able to do that as a leader. You're not going to be able to do that if you're not a really strong leader who has the confidence in what they do. Now, in my career, I sort of didn't have any choice because I wasn't an expert. So I had to walk into organizations and say, OK, this is my first job in the energy industry and I'm the CEO. And the people who were direct reports to me would look at me as if to go, well, what do you know, buddy? And I used to say to them always the same thing. I have your expertise, you're a specialist in your field, and I'm going to spend six months learning from you because I've got to learn this like a sponge so that I can become uh, you know, effectively operative at this level in this industry. But in the meantime, just have a look at some of the stuff I do and you might find out why the board has brought me in because they could have brought someone in from the industry or they could have brought one of you guys up from the level you're at. So it takes an enormous amount of confidence to demonstrate that level of fallibility and not everyone has that. So they've got to learn that over time. So we hear all the time that leaders should be fallible, and that's fine, but we shouldn't take that on face value, Scott, because it depends what else is going on. So if I'm fallible, but I'm incompetent, well, no one's gonna follow me. It'd be disastrous. They won't have any confidence in me. So you've gotta really think about what, um, what attributes you're displaying and a part of your leadership fingerprint and how they actually come out with your people and what they feel like to your people. Martin, I'm going to end the interview talking about the importance of respect before popularity. But before we go there, I'd like to invite you to share a story. I'm going to invite you to take as long as you'd like because 
the book has so many great stories of your own leadership journey, experiences of your own success and triumphs and setbacks and failures. It's a fantastic, it's a fantastic book club read. Like if you wanted to buy this book for your team leaders and go through a chapter or two a week for eight or 10 weeks and talk about it, I highly encourage you listening today to buy a dozen copies, whatever it is for your team, and read a chapter a week. And if you don't love the cover, turn the cover inside out because there are some sensitivities <laughs> on the cover. Uh, before you do that, you told a great story about someone in your organization when you were the CEO of an energy company in Australia about how you promoted to become the CEO and they gave a very simple but important speech. Would you take as much time as you need, share this story and tease out the insights you want our listeners and viewers to take from this today? Thank you, Scott. I think this is a great story because I had made two mistakes in the appointment of the Chief Operating Officer for this company. And they were great people, don't get me wrong. Uh, experienced, capable, they had a lot going for them. But at some point in time, you look at your executive team and you say, okay, well you guys are running the company as it is now, but we need more. The company can't stay where it is. So part of this is that never being happy with the status quo. And I think this does to an extent define what a high performing team is. Unless we're constantly looking to improve, we are going to go backwards relative to our competition. So I think this is a really critical concept that starts it off. But there are some things about setting a standard for performance and behavior that I think have to be sacrosanct. When I set a minimum acceptable standard for performance and behavior, no one gets a free kick on that. And I'm talking about a multi-dimensional assessment. If you're a CFO, I don't care if you're the best CFO on the planet. If you can't also lead, if you don't also have a commercial mindset, if you can't build capability, if you can't get along with others, then you're not performing in an acceptable level. So setting that standard, making sure everyone understands what you expect from. So the second chief operating officer, you know, really good guy, you know, lots of skills, very capable, uh, been around the industry, was just a great human being. And I really liked him personally, which makes this so hard, right? When you've got someone who you like personally, you can see them trying, putting the effort in, but they're not quite getting there. So I spent a long time coaching, trying to lift him, trying every which way I possibly could to give him the information that was going to resonate with him, that would help him to lift his game and perform the way he needed to. And unfortunately, I couldn't do it. I had one of his direct reports who was demonstrating an incredible level of performance. He'd had two assignments inside the company and he'd hit the ball out of the park on both of them. And I had to work out what the DNA of this individual was, why he was such a good leader. So I spent a little bit more time with him and found out what he was doing. And his ability to cut through the noise and just get to the nub of the matter was second to none. And so I made the very difficult decision to switch up. I promoted this individual from within and he went to, to, to the top of that uh, organization as my COO. And when he went in there, he said to the people that, he, that worked for him, there, there was the bulk of the organization under operations, and he said, look, I don't know what you've been working on so far. There are only three things that are important to us. Safety, volume, and cost. That's it, those three things. Nothing is more important than safety. If it contributes to safety, we'll talk about it. But there's a lot of stuff we put under the guise of safety that doesn't make the environment any safer. So let's just cut through that and work out what's really gonna make a difference. Volume, when we keep our assets producing, when they're up and running, and we're producing out of those assets, we make money. Anything that we put into increasing the availability and reliability of our equipment, I'm behind you. But it's gotta increase the availability and reliability. It's gotta be there. It's gotta be something we can trace. We trace the value from where we're investing our resources all the way through to the other end where we see the benefits come through. And then of course, cost. You know, just don't do dumb stuff. Stop spending money when you don't need to, when it's not creating value at the back end. So these three things, safety, volume, cost, that's it. And if you're doing that, we're gonna talk. If it's anything else, let it go. And I think this principle of simplicity and focus is just so powerful in being able to cut through the noise to get rid of all the extraneous activity and just do the things that are gonna take your team and your organization forward. Martin, beautifully said. I'm mindful of our time. I want to end on this topic of respect before popularity. Uh, I was once privileged at a Franklin Covey event 20 years ago to listen to a speech by former U.S. General Norman Schwarzkopf, former because he passed. 
And he said once something I'll never forget. He said, if you're not pissing people off, you're not getting stuff done. And I think I might have taken that a little too literally because I then went on for 20 <laughs> years of pissing people off and still getting stuff done. I, I mentioned that kind of tongue in cheek because there's value in that, not taken too far, right? All things in moderation. I, I think I'm a little bit unpopular in the leadership world because I hold a bit of a contrarian view about leadership. I, I don't believe everyone should be a leader of people. Now, you have a lot of people that contextualize, well, you lead the culture, yes, you lead a project, yes, but I don't think everyone should be a leader of people. I don't think everyone should be an anesthesiologist or a commercial airline pilot, and I don't think everyone should be a leader of people. And quite frankly, too often in organization, the only path to promotion, to influence, to power, to more money, to a title is to lead people. We lure a lot of people into leadership, and when we do that, we promote the wrong people on the wrong paths, and oftentimes they don't understand that leadership isn't a popularity contest. To quote you, you're always going to have some people who hate you for no reason. Some hate you for some reasons that are probably good, and others that, you know, find your leadership to be valuable. Let's land this plane with some insights around, in leadership, it's respect before popularity. And maybe inoculate our leaders that have fallen into the trap of craving their popularity of their people versus earning their respect. Thank you, Scott. The, the interesting thing here is that if you are respected, people will like you as well, but you're coming from a completely different angle. When we seek to be liked, we're going to do a whole lot of things that do not add value, that aren't good for the people we're leading, and that don't drive value for the organisation and the team. Almost everything you do as a leader has some potential for conflict, whether you're in a negotiation, whether you're trying to build a high-performing team, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, everything's going to have conflict potentially around it. So the trick here is to get your head into the space where you're not thinking about yourself, you're not trapped inside your own fear and anxiety and apprehension, you're thinking about what the other person needs, what the organisation needs at any given point in time. So one of the things for, for new leaders, and I, I say very categorically, get out of your own head. Don't think about what something means to you. Don't think about your own fear. Don't lock in on that. Lock in on the other person. You've observed something in the other person that's holding them back or that's holding the team back. And if you don't give them the benefit of that insight, you are robbing them of the opportunity to improve. So in the book, I have five filters that I talk about where if you're hesitating on a conversation, one of these filters will get your mind in the right place that you can step in and have that conversation. So even though self-awareness and introspection are critical for leaders at any level, I think getting out of your own head and thinking about what something means to another person is going to help you to connect. And this is why I say empathy is so important, because that's about the ability to see the world through someone else's eyes. The better you can do that, the better a leader you're going to be, the greater you're going to be respected, and hey, in the end, people will actually like you as well. Martin, I think you mistitled your book. Everyone in the world knows that my favorite leadership book ever written is Multipliers by Liz Wiseman. I think it's an enormously valuable leadership manual, so valuable that Franklin Covey went and licensed the content and put the Multipliers work session in our All Access Pass. But I think your book should have written the second best damn leadership book ever published because it's extraordinary. <laughs> Uh, I give Liz credit, as I give you as well. Your book is No BS Leadership by Martin Moore, based out of Boston. Uh, uh, pleasure talking with you today. I highly encourage our listeners and viewers to pick up a copy of the book. In fact, while you're at it, buy six or eight of them. Give them to all of your team members and work through it, and you will have a better leadership team. And as Martin will tell you, that's the linchpin to success in your organization. Martin Moore, thanks for your time today. Thanks so much for having me, Scott. Really appreciate it. And we'll see you back here next week for a new conversation on leadership.